A urinary tract infection, commonly known as a UTI, is an umbrella term that refers to an infection of a part of the urinary system. Broadly, UTI is divided into upper and lower UTI. Upper includes pyelonephritis, an infection of the kidney, and ureteritis, an infection of the ureters. Lower UTI includes the bladder, known as cystitis, the prostate, and the urethra, known as prostatitis and urethritis respectively. In general, however, when the term UTI is used, it is mostly referring to cystitis and possibly pyelonephritis, which are the main two we will focus on. It's also important to remember that infections can spread from one part to other parts. Normally, the urinary tract remains a sterile location, with defence mechanisms including complete voiding of the bladder, presence of the vesicoureteral valves, and urine acidity. UTIs arise when these mechanisms are overcome, most commonly by pathogens ascending the tract. A distinction is present between uncomplicated and complicated UTI. Uncomplicated is defined as occurring in non-pregnant women with no structural abnormalities. In most instances, UTIs in males occur in older adults or children and are considered complicated, but in those between the ages of 15 and 50 that are uncircumcised or have unprotected anal intercourse are considered uncomplicated. Complicated is defined as any UTI not meeting the uncomplicated criteria, generally including children, pregnancy, structural abnormalities, a comorbidity that increases infection risk like diabetes mellitus, an immunocompromised state, or chronic kidney disease. Recent surgery or device use, for example a catheter or after cystoscopy, are also considered complicated. Cystitis, as we said, is inflammation of the bladder. In females, this is mostly following intercourse, which is what gave rise to the name honeymoon cystitis, while in males, it's usually due to ascension of bacteria from the urethra or from the prostate. Pyelonephritis is when the kidney parenchyma is affected, and in females, occurs frequently with no structural abnormality, while in males, there is almost always a functional or structural cause. In most cases, it is bacteria that cause both cystitis and pyelonephritis, in particular E. coli, making up 75 to 90% of cases in the community, with other species including enterobacteria like Klebsiella or Proteus mirabilis. The most common gram-positive bacterium is Staphylococcus saprophyticus. In hospitalised patients, this is slightly different. E. coli makes up around 50%, with enterobacteria around 40%. Fungi are the most common non-bacterial cause, the main example being Candida species. Risk factors include female sex, where it is estimated to be 50 times more common between the ages of 15 to 50 compared to males. This is largely thought to be due to the anatomy, meaning a shorter urethra and so a shorter distance for bacteria to ascend, and close proximity to other sources of infection like the vulvular vestibule and anus. The presence of prostate enlargement and the use of devices like catheters means UTI becomes more common in males, but remains less common than it is in females. Others include sexual activity, use of products that disrupt vaginal microbiome, including hygiene products, and antibiotics. Structural abnormalities increase the risk, the most common being vesicoureteral reflux, responsible for 30 to 45% of symptomatic urinary tract infections in children. And UTI may also be a possible complication of spinal injury. Bladder diverticula are another example of structural abnormalities. Obstructions to the flow of urine are another factor. Examples being benign prostatic hyperplasia, malignancies of the urinary tract, and calculi. Factors that prevent emptying, like neurogenic bladder 
or uterine prolapses are also risk factors. Common signs of UTI include stinging or discomfort on passing urine, known as dysuria, increased urinary frequency, and even incontinence, especially in more elderly patients. Also, notably urination at night, known as nocturia, and suprapubic tenderness, and possibly hematuria. Upper UTI can have similar symptoms, with features like high fever, flank pain, or costovertebral angle tenderness suggesting an upper UTI. Bear in mind that patients may also present with nausea, vomiting, and even delirium and sepsis in some instances, particularly the elderly. Importantly, many people over the age of 65, or with indwelling catheters, will have the presence of bacteria in the urine, but are asymptomatic and do not necessarily need treatment. A subset of patients warrants screening and treatment for asymptomatic bacteria, including pregnant women, children with vesicourethral reflux, and those with kidney transplants. In general, the diagnosis is made based on the presence of clinical symptoms, supported by urine investigations. Urine dipstick is useful as presence of white blood cells or nitrites, and blood is suggestive of UTI, but it is not reliable in those over the age of 65 or those who are catheterized due to the likelihood of asymptomatic bacteria. Persistent microscopic hematuria after resolution of the infection will require further investigation. A culture is useful to confirm the presence of bacteria and to provide antibiotic sensitivities. Imaging is indicated in some cases, such as if structural or functional causes are suspected, and possible options could be ultrasound or CT. The treatment generally involves antibiotics. However, in some cases of mild, uncomplicated UTI, patients may be treated conservatively without antibiotics or with a backup prescription with supportive advice such as hydration and analgesia. Trimethoprim, nitroferentoin, pivmacillinum, amoxicillin and phosphomycin are common agents. In complicated cases, it's common to have slightly longer durations of therapy, with seven-day courses being used commonly. Cases of pyelonephritis also require antibiotic treatment, such as cotrimoxazole or coamoxiclav, and are more likely to require admission and supportive care. Recurrent UTIs are defined as more than two UTIs in six months, or three in 12 months, and should be advised measures such as hygiene advice and prophylactic antibiotics, with further investigation in some cases to rule out underlying predisposition, including malignancy.